Hey folks, Nick Corbertson here, and today we're making a sequencer app for iOS using AudioKit and 100 lines of code. 100 lines of code. Let's get started. All right, so last time we made a drum pad app, and this time we're starting off by reusing some of that code to load up a sampler instrument, and we'll be using it later to build our layout. So to start, we have our audio engine, an Apple sampler, a playing Booleans array, and our notes array. So like the drum pad, with the sequencer, we're basically using AudioKit's Apple sampler, but rather than tapping a button to play the note, our sequencer is triggering the note. Once again, the code for this and all the other 100 lines of code examples will be up on GitHub. Huzzah! All right, so now that we have the basic setup, we can create our sequencer. We'll make an Apple sequencer instance called Sequencer and create a MIDI callback instrument. This will allow the sequencer to respond to note on and note off events. And once again, I've got to give a huge shout out to Evan at Aura Audio for his tutorial on making a sequencer with AudioKit. I'll link that video in the description. I'm using his example and the music toy example from the AudioKit cookbook as a starting point. In the init method, we'll start by creating a new track on our sequencer, setting the link, setting the output to our MIDI callback instrument, enable looping, and play the sequencer. But of course we need something for our sequencer to play, so we're gonna add a note to the first track of our sequencer. Sequencers can have multiple tracks just like MIDI files, so you can have one sequencer controlling multiple instruments. But rather than sending the output directly to our instrument, we are sending it to our MIDI callback instrument, and we will play our instrument from there. You'll see what I mean in a minute, maybe. All right, and down here on the bottom, when we stop the engine, we also wanna stop the sequencer, and let's see if it compiles. Okay, it does, but we are getting a warning that says we need to enable background audio mode. And if you right click and jump to definition on our MIDI callback instrument, you'll see that it's mentioned there too. Warning. Let this be a reminder that if things don't work, number one, try to reset package caches, and number two, check the console for warnings. So to enable this, we'll click on the app, tap on the plus sign, add background modes capability, and toggle on audio. Now we can run our app again and the warning's gone. We've still done nothing, but it feels like we're getting somewhere. Now we've added a note to our sequencer track, but we want it to play an instrument. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our MIDI callback listener. And here we'll print the status to see what values we're getting for note on and note off. Down in the console, you'll see we're getting 144 for note on and 128 for note off. I don't know why they chose these numbers, but it's safe to assume it's magic. Now armed with this new knowledge, we can say that if the status is set to 144, we'll trigger the note on, else if it's equal to 128, we will trigger a note off. When these events are called, we wanna play the note on for our sampler instrument, and let's see that running in the application. Awesome, so we have sound being triggered by the sequencer. Now we'll stop the instrument once the notes duration has completed. We'll run it once again, and you should hear the notes being cut off. Since we'll want the ability to add a bunch of notes, let's make a couple of helper methods to add and remove notes to the sequencer. And now that we have the sequencer working, let's work on the user interface. Once again, I'll grab some code from our drum pad example and edit the values to give us a 16 by five grid that corresponds with our sequencer. Here is how that looks, but we need to add the logic for adding events to our sequencer. In our sequencer pad, when a button is pressed, we'll toggle the state of the playing Boolean and add or remove note events to our sequencer. One gotcha for removing events is that the method that we're using will actually clear all the notes from that section. That means that we'll have to go back in and re-add the MIDI notes that we didn't intend to move whenever someone hit the button. So say for example on one of your rows you might be hitting a snare drum and a hi-hat at the same time and you might want to remove the hi-hat. Well now you can remove the hi-hat and it will still play the snare drum because we've added it back in. There might be a better way to do this. I don't know if there's a better way to do this. Let me know in the comments if there's a better way to do this. And here we go. Now we can check out our progress once again in the simulator. This is great and all, I'm still having a good time, but I wanna see those notes light up when they're playing. Fortunately, Evan has already solved this problem for us. To do this, we will create a row is active variable and set the current row when a note is played. We can then take that value and use it to add a glow to our button if is active is true. Then on our button, we will check for a change in the conductor's row is active to toggle on the button's is active state. And here we are right at our limit of 100 lines. Let's check out the demo.
All right, so everything is working properly. We're at 100 lines, but there's one nagging problem in the back of my mind, and that is that there is a bug in Apple's music sequencer. The longer you're a developer, the more you will come to realize that all software is a giant stack of cards just waiting to topple over. So AudioKit's Apple sequencer is a layer just on top of Apple's music sequencer. And there is a known bug that whenever you start the sequencer, it will skip and glitch sometimes. Basically what happens is it'll play the first note in time and then it glitches out and lags for a little bit and then it catches up and then it will play everything in time from that point on. And since this bug is in Apple's code, really all we can do is report it to Apple, but you as a developer, you can't fix the bug. So you have to find a way to either use the code as is, choose a different sequencer, or cry about it and find a workaround. Well, I've chosen the third route, and now that I'm done crying, let me illustrate the issue and a potential workaround. So first I'll jump into Logic and make a MIDI file. Next I'll drag it into our project, and rather than creating the new track, we'll just read the data from the MIDI file and print when the note is being triggered in the callback. I'll also add a button with a state variable to toggle the sequencer on and off and rewind the sequencer to the beginning after it is stopped. You can hear and see that the second note is being delayed. Any value that's after the decimal place is the delay in the note being played. To reduce latency, it is recommended to pre-roll the sequencer, so we'll try that out and we have the same result. Okay, so after experimenting for a while, here is the best solution I've come up with. What we do want to do is we do want to pre-roll the sequencer because it only has those glitches at startup. So basically, we want to warm the sequencer up, have it running for a little while, and then have the audio kick in. But because you can't pre-roll before the very first note of the sequence, what we're going to do is we're going to play the end of the sequence and then have it loop back to the beginning, but we will only have the audio start playing once it loops back to the beginning. So to visualize, this area is the pre-roll where we are not playing any audio, but since we can't have it before our sequence, we're gonna just pre-roll it at the end of the loop and then have it come back to the beginning. This is the very definition of a hack, but it works. Welcome to programming. If anyone has a better solution for this, I'd love to hear it down in the comments. And you know, sometimes you might not even have to do this hack because I have noticed on some tracks, like the ones from the music toy, that you don't even hear the glitch. Somehow that they've set up the MIDI track, you don't really notice it. But if you're trying to play like a fast sequence right whenever your sequencer starts up, you will probably hear it. And this is what you can do to work around it. So now you can see and hear that we have fixed in big quotation marks the issue. Let's try it without the MIDI using the new track method. And if your instrument is still loading the sound slowly, then you can lower the buffer length in your app's delegate. This can lead to popping on older devices, so sometimes it's useful to have changing this an editable option for your users. I also just had an idea to make the 100 lines examples all different colors, so I'm gonna go ahead and make everything purple now. This sort of scattered cat chasing a laser pointer approach, that's how I roll. Since we're starting the loop near the end of the sequence, we don't want those notes to play. So we'll create an is loading boolean, and we'll toggle that off when we start the sequence sequencer and we'll set it to true when it loops around and restarts the sequence. If we hit play, the app ignores the end of the loop and it starts playing once it gets to the beginning. All right, we're almost done. Now let's clean up a few things, remove that on change notification since we don't really need it for this example, but you can still find it in the drum pad example. And what else do we have? Okay, so these add and remove methods, those are just helper methods. So what I'm gonna do is I'll drag the body of those down into our sequencer pad view where we are calling those methods. We'll add some comments so that future us's still know what's going on. This isn't ideal, but neither is having to work around a giant sequencer bug. All right, so we delete those methods, and now if we scroll down, ah, whoo, it's not the prettiest code I've ever written, but we have a working sequencer and 100 lines of code. Now glitch free. I'm kind of glad I got to show this workaround for the bug because I, I haven't found a solution for it online as I looked around and also I feel like I'm trying to do this workaround hacky stuff all the time so it kind of shows you what real software development is like. Thanks for watching the video folks. This was a tricky one but we got through it. 
Join me next time when we're going to be making a synth in 100 lines of code. Come holler at me in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time. 100 lines of code.